Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. A very good morning and a very warm welcome to all your viewers. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in to our very first virtual youth career forum. Uh, this is an initiative by Sikh Nojuan Sabah Malaysia. And uh, we are very pleased to announce that this is going to be first of many series, the details of which will be informed uh, uh, as and when we move along. Uh, as many of you all who have tuned in are aware, this particular forum today is going to be focused on law, uh, the legal industry. And uh, the aim or objective of this session is uh, to provide an insight into what it actually takes to be a lawyer, what does a lawyer go through on a daily basis, what are the characteristics, what are the traits of a lawyer, what are things that you have to look out for. And maybe for those who are in the period of uh, making a decision whether do I do law or not, uh, probably or hopefully this session will be able to give you one or two tips as to what awaits you in the real world. Uh, as, as Sikh Nojuan Sabah Malaysia is uh, extremely grateful for having uh, to accommodate three prominent speakers. They are all leaders uh, in the industry. And uh, without further ado, before I introduce the first speaker, let me just give you all a brief uh, introduction about him. Now the first speaker, he graduated from the University of uh, Kent in Canterbury in 1998 and uh, thereafter he completed his Masters of Laws in Criminology and Criminal Justice in uh, University of London, King's College in the year 2000. He then came back to Malaysia. Uh, he got called to the bar in the year 2001 and it has been 20 years uh, since he has been in active practice till today, till today. And uh, as of today he is still the managing partner of uh, Messrs. Rabinder, Budiman and Associates, uh, which he has been uh, a managing partner of since the year 2003. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Dato Rabinder Singh. Dato Ji, thank you very much for spending your Saturday morning with us. We are extremely grateful. Uh, Dato Ji, I will move uh, very uh, swiftly into the question. Uh, some of the students, or rather the viewers here, they are in the period of uh, making a decision whether do I join law or why do I want to do law, should I even do law in the first place. You have been in active practice for 20 over years. Now, first question, what was it that uh, made you do law? Was it passion or were there other uh, factors involved in that decision making? All right. Um, a very good morning. Thank you, Mahjo. Uh, Vai Guruji Ka Khalsa, Vai Guruji Ki Fateh. Uh, to all the participants and those who are present here today, um, thank you so much, Sikh Nojuan Sabha, for this initiative. It's great. Um, it's a wonderful thing that uh, we could connect to the youth um, and uh, spend some time. Uh, I am also grateful that I was considered as quote unquote Mahjo Singh. <laughs> Uh, leader of the industry, I, I, I don't think I'm one there. Are many more senior practitioners who are uh, far more qualified and far more experienced, but I'll try my best to give my two cents worth uh, in this. Um, what was the passion? All right, okay. Well, to be honest, um, it was just because from the time I was young, I could not shut up and uh, uh, I spent many hours of the day outside the classroom, standing on the chair, standing on the table, sweeping the class, taking care of the Tupperwares, all because my mouth couldn't close. I was then told by the teacher, I think that the only skill that you have is this mouth and you should participate in either debate, storytelling, speech. So I did all that. And uh, secondly, of course, my father, Indrajit Singh, who was a lawyer, is, is a lawyer. He's my consultant now. Um, yeah. Uh, I think in the seniority list, his top 10 uh, called in 68, Shankar was his uh, master, Mahade Shankar. Uh, thirdly, of course, television helped, yeah, LA Law, all that. And uh, fourthly, and more importantly, uh, 
was the passion of uh, doing something uh, that hopefully could make a difference, yeah, you know. And uh, that came from the very fact that uh, the only person that I told my father that if I want to do law with and I must come back to was because uh, I was awestruck by Karpal. Reading the newspapers, Karpal did this, Karpal did that, Karpal went in and all that. And so YB was uh, a legend, uh, truly the tiger of Julie Tong. And uh, so I had that honor. And uh, yeah, so it was a combination of uh, many things that led to this passion. So it's, uh, it's a combination of a few, a few things. Uh. Now, interestingly, uh, to those viewers uh, watching, uh, I was informed uh, that uh, you actually achieved what you wanted to, which is to chamber with uh, the late Karpal. Yeah. And, and soon after, you joined uh, Tansri Mama Shafi, who is also another very prominent figure. Yeah. I, I believe that our viewers uh, probably see him in the newspapers almost every day now. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I must say, I am grateful, uh, utmostly, that... Uh, YB took me in under his wing as a chambering pupil and uh, I, not only him, I, I had the pleasure of working with, you know, Jagdeep when he was in practice, Gobin uh, still in practice, YB, YB Jagdeep and YB Ram Karpal was there as well and these guys were great to work with, um, great guys, father was awesome. Um, and uh, Tansri Shafi is a great litigator, a great titan of the legal industry as well. Politics aside, both of them had different ways of approaching law, different cross-examination techniques, different submission methods. But I must say, because of these two uh, great lawyers, uh, YB Karpal still has the most amount of uh, reported cases in the MLJ of any lawyer until today. I, I don't think that record is going to be broken uh, anytime soon. Um, and yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, he developed it. And uh, I mean, Tansri Shafi needs no introduction from me. <laughs> and so because of that, I was able to hone my skills, get whatever I could from them, and make whatever I could of myself. I, I could have never been where I am if not for these individuals. Right. Now, Dr. Uh, you mentioned about uh, <coughs> they were great lawyers. Yeah. Shafi is a great lawyer. Right. YB, of course, as you mentioned, no doubt. What were the characteristics of uh, the late Karpal or Shafi, or even for the matter of fact, uh, Gobin and, and uh, Ram, or Gobin and Jagdeep, sorry. What, what did they possess that you inherited and uh, what are those characteristics that maybe you can share with some of our young viewers, which they should strive to possess, which will enable them, you know, to, to, to have a better practice? Um, well, of course, they were diligent in their work. They were hardworking. They were meticulous. YB Karpal had the awesome ability to take a record of appeal, which is this thick, a submission, point out the most important point, argue that and succeed in the case, which is a rare ability which I followed him to the Court of Appeal, Federal Court, and uh, he, would, he would not waste time arguing frivolous points, he would, not, he would just narrow down the issues, summarize and say, my lords, this is the point, this is why I'm here, this is what should be done. And, that, but that, of course, took skill and time, but the diligence, the hard working, the preparation that went behind it, I mean, success can't be just achieved like that. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Tansri Shafi is a meticulous person, let me just tell you. The submissions that he goes through, the legal research, does it quite a lot himself. Yeah, and uh, so that is the skill, you know, uh, and that is something that I, I, I really wanted to see from them and to get to know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's through hard work. There's, there's no shortcuts. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Dataji, uh, this is a rather interesting question. Uh, I'm sure many of uh, the viewers are also interested, especially the ones that are making the decision whether should they pursue law or not. 
uh, let's put it, it's a, it's a very direct question. How hard does one have to work? Because you mentioned earlier about being meticulous and being hardworking. How hard does one actually have to work to be able to drive the Mercedes, the BMWs, wear the Rolexes, and buy a house, a landed property in Kuala Lumpur? Okay, uh, this is a good question. I used to uh, lecture the ethics under the Bar Council, the ethics program, under professional conducts. Until now, it's uh, done online, so the video is online, my videos I see. for them. And I used to tell the young lawyers uh, that um, everybody did law, no one is here because they wanted to be poor, because they wanted to, you know, everybody wants to achieve success and ambition, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, the way in which we have to succeed and reach ambition is why we are here because if you look at the antecedents, the statistics of the lawyers being struck out, the 0 to 5 are the highest, the 5 to 10 goes down, the 10 to 15. And it's because is there a base for understanding of the ethical principles and what you're about to do? So by all means be professional. How much work you have to put in, of course, there is no quantity of hard work that you can actually quantify. I work two hours a day, I work eight hours a day, I do 12 hours a day. Of course, there's also the principle of working hard and working smart. Um, but the thing is, um, whilst working hard, whilst working smart, don't forget the ethical principles because of the, NCT, uh, of the statistics I've just mentioned. And uh, um, there will be temptations to take shortcuts especially when you are younger, to achieve success in a faster and more efficient manner. <laughs> to say that nicely, to get, as you say, the first Mercedes, BMW, I mean, for that matter, any <laughs> continental car, uh, landed property and otherwise. Uh, but in that strife, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget to be true to yourself and to be true to the fact that you still belong to this honourable profession, it may sound like a joke, there are so many lawyers jokes out there nowadays, that when <coughs> some people hesitate, they say, I, I don't introduce myself, you know, as a lawyer because I get frowns, I get looks, I get rolled eyeballs. Uh, but for the matter, this is an honourable profession and it started out to be that and it shall carry on to be that and that's what the Bar of Malaysia are striving to do and that's what we should strive to do. Because at the end of the day, um, when you have, you have the superpower, you know, we have a superpower, let me just tell you. There are about 80 odd high court judges, the superpower that they have is to sentence someone, sentence someone legally to death, which is an awesome ability which you cannot, but you have the power to put on a robe, to go there and to actually, um, to actually defend a person to give them a good, uh, I mean to give them justice, to give them a good hearing, to give uh, a chance for this person, which how many people in Malaysia can do? Yeah. So I always inform the lawyers, I said, you know, you're wearing this robe, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's something to be proud of and it's something to take note of, of the traditions that have come before this. So. In that, please don't embarrass the rest of us because the lawyers, the headline doesn't read your name. It reads, lawyer conducted CBT. <laughs> lawyer stole crimes money. So the lawyer is the 16,000 of us in the bar. Mm -hmm. sure. okay. so, uh, I have a, a question flowing from that. But before that, uh, to all the viewers, uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, I believe uh, the question box is available. If you're on your tablet, it's on the right, and if you're on the phone, it's at the bottom. Uh, please take this opportunity, ask any questions. There are no bars here, you can ask anything you want under the sun. Take this opportunity and ask those questions. Now, Dataji, uh, just flowing from the earlier question, it's, it's, it's rather interesting to note that uh, the most number of uh, disbarred solicitors or advocates are between the years zero to five. Mm. And, uh, I've experienced that because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm going through my junior years and I noticed uh, that some of my friends, my peers, have actually gone to the DB, oh. which is rather interesting. Now, the question is this. Initial years, we have to work hard. Or unfortunate? Well, 
uh, it's it's rather unfortunate for them, right. but it's an eye opener for me okay. to to tread very carefully, like what you mentioned, yeah. because at the end of the day, it is the the, the dignity of the entire profession. Right. right. Now, early years of our career, uh, there is no two ways about it. It is hard work, hard work, hard work. You have been in the in practice for twenty over years. Is it still the same? Legal practice is as good as equating oneself with being a Sikh, where you are a learner, because law keeps changing. You have to keep up with the times. You have to read the uh, latest cases. You have got to read the journals to keep up with how law is fluid. So you can't say, I know everything. No one is going to say, I know everything, because it's changing. It's being argued day in and day out. So you have to be diligent no matter what to keep with the statutes that are coming out, with the textbooks, with the changing nature, course of law. And so obviously it never stops, right? right. It gets easier because you hone your skills to know, you know, uh, a certain set of rules, so basic principles are there, you know, for whether it's court, or whether it's contract, whether it's taught. But then, at the same time, law is also evolving into specialized fields. I mean, in the good old days, in 1968, when you asked my father, when there were 500 lawyers in Kuala Lumpur, 500, everybody did everything, you know, uh, and everybody was ex assumed to, law was not developed at how it is. Now you've got practitioners doing nothing but marine law, and they've got a niche market for that. You've got IP, you've got cyber. I mean, they just specialize because that's, that's what it is, taxation, you know. And so forth, so on. So, I mean, it is becoming more and more. You can't know everything, but of course, a little bit, jack of all trades, a master of none. As general litigation, you know, as a general litigator, you've got to know because you've got people coming through the door who are going to say to you, or the famous thing that happens, you know, when you go to a dinner party or you go to a friend's house or relative, hey, I want to ask you Burani manna, a punch minute, punch minute, you know, and actually it's not punch minute, they just want free advice. But, I mean, you can't say, you know, I don't actually do this, I don't know, I know how it is. And uh, a lot of people come to me and say, you know, what's the up and coming specialized fields that you should pick? I mean, it's, a, it's what's your passion, you know, if your passion of a certain... As you can see, I did a specialization in the LLM. Right. Um, actually, I did the bar in England, in, uh, in, uh, in London, then I did the LLM. So I was there, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I was interested in criminal law, and so I did criminology and criminal justice as a specialized subset. But there are many fields that are coming up and coming now. Uh, I believe we have a question. Before we move to that question, I just have uh, another very interesting uh, uh, issue. As you mentioned, the only change is constant. The only constant is change. Mm. And uh, as you can appreciate, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, even the courts have now started uh, going online. We have conducted uh, hearings online, and I would say maybe about 60% of hearings are done online. Yeah. And uh, the question is this: If you read uh, example, if you read Tiger of Jalutung, mm. the book, it, it talks to you, uh, or rather the reader understands what uh, the late Kar uh, YB Karpa, you take your robe, you walk to court, you address the, the, the court, and then you come out, then the interviewers, they interview you. You know, you have that, that real feel when you fight for justice. Now, it is of carry the robe, you walk to your room, and you sit there in front of a computer. So, many people, or rather many junior lawyers, uh, in the crossroads, whether how do we enhance our advocacy? Because, of course, court advocacy is slightly different than presenting in front of a computer. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it is, of course, unfortunate that this situation has come about, and definitely it will have an impact on advocacy because the give and take from the bench, looking at the judges, uh, fielding their questions witnesses, knowing how they are answering, their demeanor, these are all points that have to be taken into account and submitted on even. Um, however, we have no choice but this. But saying that Singapore already started online long before COVID. 
you know and uh, so it will have an impact on advocacy that is no doubt um, <clears throat> but we still have to strive for this as best as we as, as, best, as best we can First question that comes in from uh, Rohit Lal. The question is, which law speci specialization would you recommend in the future, understanding the changing patterns in the demand for different types of law? Um, firstly, there are two parts to answer. Do law because you're passionate. Do a job that makes you wake up in the morning. And after 20 years, if you can still do it, then you're in the correct field. So, second part of it is, of course, a commercial. Do uh, a practice a field of law which requires demand. Don't do something, obviously, that will be fizzled out. So, the, of course, the upcoming legal fields, now that social media, we've got cyber law, um, we've got international trade, uh, we've got uh, mediation, arbitration, courts are moving away from that dispute, uh, alternate dispute, uh, dispute resolutions, um, uh, aerospace, we have got even got space law coming in. Yeah, so these are special, uh, yeah, specialties which are being offered in the universities as well. Um, but of course, you have to take into account that you are in Malaysia, so please don't do things like space law and all. I mean, please, uh, yeah. So, uh, but um, yeah, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, commercial litigation, of course, bread and butter, general litigation is there. Um, robots, unfortunately, are not going to take over our job because it requires a fairly amount of subjective thinking. Right. So we are lucky there. AI can't possibly do a cross-examination. It can to the basic principles, but it can't read demeanor and start saying, okay, the witness is now... Uh, not telling the truth, I'm going to put the questions, I'm going to put it to the witness, you know, I mean, you can't, you do, you can't have an AI do that. I mean, probably in the future, if AI develops, so we are fairly uh, safe in that. Uh, we are fairly safe in that. Right. Uh, I, I guess it boils down to the human touch when it comes to uh, uh, cross-examining a witness, as you mentioned. AI yeah. most definitely... You can't, you can't. Like you know, even for judges, I mean... <laughs> You can read the demeanor, you know, are you wasting time at this point? Do you need to move forward? I mean, yeah. this is part and parcel of practice. You, you're not, you know, submitting to a robot up there. You're also submitting to a human being. You're also speaking to a human being. So, right. yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be a long way off. We, we're not going to go that fast. So, so I, I guess to all those who may be wondering, because I was wondering, in fact, uh, whether if I was in your shoes, uh, if I was, uh, I just finished my SPM, Will I still choose law? Because everything, now AI is coming into play and all. So I guess the answer is yes. Can, can, can. No issue with that. No issue. <laughs> brothers, by all means, do law. All right, Dataji, next question from uh, Kelvin De Kaur. Uh, what language is used by the lawyers in the Malaysian courts? All right, okay, good question. A National Language Act is Bahasa Malaysia. You are allowed to use it right from the bottom, which is Penghulu Court, Magistrates, Small Craves Tribunal, Sessions Court, High Court, Court of Appeal, Federal Court. No one can stop you. No one can say stop submitting in Bahasa. English is a preferred option in the superior courts. But however, leave has to be granted, meaning you have to ask uh, that may I submit in uh, English. Uh, usually in High Court, in uh, Court of Appeal and Federal Court, it is almost taken uh, as uh, accepted. As you can see, the cases are still being reported in English. However, for the lower courts, Magistrates Court and Sessions Court, uh, it's the converse. It should be in Bahasa Malaysia, right. you know. Yeah. But there are still being some being reported in English. Ah, uh, they do. Yeah. yeah. But you don't get many sessions court judges uh, writing their judgments as much as you do, and right. being reported in the MLGs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay, Datuji. Next question. Uh, what is your approach and philosophy in winning a case? Wow, uh, wow. Very, very interesting question. Wow, what <laughs> is your approach and this Rohit La champion? Oh, I think we should get him. <laughs> uh, no, good question. Um, an approach, of course, know your law, know your facts, and know your judge. It's not the other way around, huh? although many people think know your judge and then know. Yeah, okay. Because uh, know your law in that when you're starting a case, you should understand the legal background, what are the legal principles. When they come to you, they say, my neighbor's tree is now encroaching into my land. Can I just go and cut it down? You must know 
we must understand what the law entails in this matter dbkr bylaw says that you're not supposed to cut a tree above uh, two meters without their permission did you know that uh, better no uh, better no so philosophy in winning please ladies and gentlemen everybody wants to win as i started saying nobody wants to lose everybody wants to be ambitious however there is a line being drawn mahajot you should know that uh, in this don't take shortcuts don't mislead the court don't create evidence don't coach witnesses that one all don't do la uh, it's tempting it's tempting uh, to win tell your clients your clients will say i paid you so you must do tell them you paid me as a lawyer you didn't buy my soul so the temptation is there i will do this case to the best of my abilities with legal profession ethical considerations in mind but that's it so so i guess the, the, the universal say no no do not do whatever it wins do not do whatever it takes to win please yeah okay that's the yeah, no no that doesn't apply here because that principle has led to the db board okay thank you uh, that will principle will lead you to misma maran very quickly on a fast track please carry on uh, okay uh, very quickly dato ji next question in your various positions you have experienced numerous challenges throughout your legal career no doubt about that ha huh. could you share one such example of a challenge and how did you overcome that oh my god the worst uh, i mean there have been numerous uh, experiences uh the one that stands out um one is recent one is quite uh, before this was our dato balwan was charged for murder so big issue in the sikh community ah huh? since sikh knowledge wants about being here you can imagine lah huh? uh distinguished member ah huh? ex president of gspj you know ex <laughs> and uh calling me and saying ah ho gaya mainu hun kive mainu pachauni ah he is 82 being charged do you think he can go to sungai gulo and stand the remand it's a death sentence jo <laughs> so next question how do we get him bail we argued with the first it's the first reported case in malaysia of somebody under 302 getting bail yep. that was not easy we used indian examples we got the medical reports done that the paul was game as he then was in the high court uh, tan sri shafi took it on myself tan and dr kumarendran all of us argued uh, he had a awesome uh, team led by the dpp as well uh, amma bachi was there he's a judge now zaudi alud khan is the sg so i mean uh, yeah that was not easy uh, recently um i had a client uh, obviously names can't be used la legal uh, profession uh, practice and ethical rules section 1 to 6 evidence act <laughs> so anyway uh, he was sentenced to death and uh, he was subsequently pardoned but he was still in prison his wife got terminally ill uh, they called me at 9 o'clock and said look she's dying the family uh we have to keep her alive because you can't take him out first thing in the morning call sunga glow prison uh managed to get him out to come and see her in uh and just as he came just as we were talking she died in front of us uh never mind uh after she died in front of us and uh, they happily had me handcuffed uh, <laughs> oh together with him and together with the utk all of us together one uh, so nobody goes anywhere else and uh, yeah anyway it was a sad experience after that we had to go back to court and do a hearing yeah my opponent wouldn't give yeah my opponent wouldn't give me a uh, leeway he said the uh, witness came from our station so uh, at 3 o'clock continue cross examination until 8 o'clock and i finish off the case judge wanted to finish it off so juru basa asked me are you okay itu ora mati ya depan saya mati ya so macam mana ai kata kena datang sini you tak bagi peluang <laughs> so oh. this a yeah oh that 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 is uh, something really uh, insightful even for me that's the next question from shireen oh do you recommend studying locally or acquiring a degree from abroad is there a difference in developing skill sets and going further as a lawyer Yes uh the answer is going to be very unpopular big fields college and all uh, atc <laughs> going to hit me obviously starting uh 
abroad is going to make a difference because of the experiences that you're going to get and the study of the law from the country of origin, which is England. Secondly, doing the bar. Uh, the bar exam is actually 40% oral and 60% writing because they want you to experience it. They ask you, there is a subject matter which is cross-examination, negotiation, interview skills with the and they get actors, you know, to come in. So the actors, uh, <laughs> the actors' uh, school will come in, and we will be the legal school, a law school, and so we'll take turns. And so they'll cry, they'll shy, and they, this is all. And it's because this is what's really going to happen to you, you know. When you come back and do practice, it's not going to be from the book, and you're going to suddenly. I mean, this is practice. Practice is completely different from what you studied. So that experience will come from. Uh, studying in abroad, which is unless they revamp the complete CLP here and get it done, which I don't, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I, I know no, of no such plan. So obviously, and of course, going abroad, being responsible for yourself, uh, going to a foreign country, having experiences, uh, it's, it's going to be different. Going to the bar, going to the inns, having your dining with judges, with senior barristers, they're all very f informal. You sit down in a group of four, you do your dinings. Awesome. Right. So, so your, your advice would be, if possible, explore the bar. Of course, cost lah, brother. Cost, yeah. Looking at the financial mm, means. Cost, but if you can, that. if you can succeed in getting it and you can do it, please, go. Right. Right. It will be an experience that will change you. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, question from uh, J. Raj Dev Singh. Uh, how do you value a case before you take it on? How do you value? Value in terms of what? Monetary wise or value the principles? Uh, or uh, Well, okay. Uh, as you know, there's no <laughs> set of fees huh? yeah. for litigation. That's only for SRO. Is, yes. is only for uh, conveyancing. Uh, value the case is based on the evidence that is presented in the law and you have to be honest with the client and tell them do, do you have a weak case, do you have a strong case after you hear the evidence that is put before you and study the law and what does the law say in relation to this matter right. you know for example I did a paternity case she had no evidence that uh, he was a bastard child he wanted to claim maintenance from his father he wanted to, he was 16 he wanted to become a pilot, it cost 200 over 1000. She has no money, she's a hair salonist uh, and hairdresser. In a, uh, and uh, so she, this guy was pretty uh, keeping her for many years and he had a son. And so I said, you know, what proof? And she said, I've got one or two photographs. And then every year he'll send an ang pao. <laughs> Obviously, you can't force somebody to do a paternity test, so it's weak. But I said, let's go to court and ask him to do a paternity test. Right. And then see what's his answer. And then once the paternity test comes out, it's conclusive evidence. Mm -hmm. Of course, he came up with all sorts of reasons. It's weak. But then finally, we convinced the judge to say, you know, why would an adverse inference be drawn against him? Lah, because he doesn't want to come to court. Right. And why should he give all this, you know, if this is not his son? Right. So, yeah. So, evidentially, you have to weigh. Right. Ah. So, I guess the answer is, uh, it's definitely a case by case basis. Yep. You've got to look at what evidence is presented. There's no such thing. There's no fixed formula. 2 plus 4 in law does not equal 4. <laughs> yes. 2 plus 4 is what? 2 plus 2 is what you make it. <laughs> right. It can be 3, 3.5, 4, 4.7. That's up to you. Okay. Right. That's it. I think we have got uh, a time Do we require for one a last question. Ah. Right. So, uh, this question is from Narinda Kaur. Do we require a credit in Barsa Malaysia at SPM level to do law? I did IGCSE and don't have SPM Barsa Malaysia. You need a credit in Barsa Malaysia for SPM to do law. That is a very obvious thing. But of course, if you don't, then you can do the equivalency exam and you get called to the bar. Right. Uh, I did IGSE and don't have SPM. Uh, as far as concerned, I am unsure. But uh, the last that we checked, uh, the IGSE, uh, SC, Barsa qualification does not merit and does not is not equivalent to the SPM pass that is required for certain courses like medical and otherwise it may be sufficient but not for law. Right, okay. Right, Datuji, uh, I must thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, just to sum up, uh, some questions were asked from the viewers themselves but I think the take home points would be uh, the secret to success is uh, three. Hard work, hard work, hard work. 
uh, along, the, along the years, you will learn that uh, it's not necessarily what the client tells you is the truth. You've got to take it uh, at face value, do your own uh, due diligence, your own research. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, uh, if you are deciding whether you should do law or not, don't worry too much about uh, uh, what will happen. Because what will happen will happen. It's a matter of you taking uh, any challenge and uh, taking it on and striving through it. Right, uh, Dataji, once again, thank you very much. Uh, for taking time out. Thank you, Marjot, for having me. Thank you, Nojwan Sabah. And uh, to all the viewers, yeah. thank you. And Vaigruji Ka Khalsa, uh, Vaigruji Ki Fethi. I wish you all all the best with your future endeavors and you too. Thank you, Dr. All right, take thank care. You. Wow, that was uh, an extremely insightful session. Uh, next. Uh, as far as that was the first speaker or first guest speaker. Now, moving on, this is the second guest speaker, and I believe uh, we have been waiting, eagerly waiting for this uh, guest speaker to arrive. And uh, before we uh, move on to introduce the speaker, let me allow me allow me to briefly explain uh, the background of the speaker. The next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, studied law at University of London in uh, 1997. She completed her CLP in 1999, and she was called to the bar in the year 2001. Thereafter, she joined uh, the same law firm that she is with now, uh, Messrs. Dime and Gamani, and has been practicing there ever since. Uh, the, the, the next speaker that is, uh, is going to be presented to you all uh, co-founded the very uh, famous Lawyers for Liberty, it's an NGO, uh, in 2011. Y'all the, the, viewers will appreciate, uh, maybe the law students and the long, young lawyers, uh, y'all will know that there are many reported decisions. There are many human rights issues that came forward uh, because of uh, the efforts of uh, Lawyers for Liberty, the efforts of the next speaker, and uh, very recently, you will appreciate that uh, she was also the, she was appointed as the uh, Malaysian Anti-Corruption Anti -corruption Chief Commissioner on the 4th of uh, June 2019. The next speaker, I think I can uh, say the name already, uh, Ms. Latifa Koya, uh, she is notably known to be a fearless advocate uh, for the defenseless, the victims of injustice, you all can go on YouTube. There are so many videos of her. Uh, please watch it. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Ms. Latifa Koya. Thank you very much for agreeing, Miss. Thank uh, you. Uh, we, we are very grateful at Signal Jones above for agreeing, uh, for you to agree to come today. Uh, I can only imagine how busy your schedule is. It's okay. <laughs> All right, Miss. Uh, we have a set of viewers here. Some of them have uh, finished uh, their schooling uh, after Form 5, some of them are law students, some of them are young lawyers. So before we uh, move to the question, first very interesting question, what inspired Latifa Koya to do law? It's actually very difficult to answer that question. Uh, I can't really remember how I got stuck with law. <laughs> I think, um, you know, after Form 5, and, and then I was one of those who also took uh, STPM. Right. And then, you know, after STPM, you are left with very little choice if you're not very rich. Uh, I heard uh, our colleague uh, earlier who said that, try to go overseas. But unfortunately, I came from a relatively middle class uh, family, so going overseas is not an option. So I was told that you have to study hard and try to get into a local university. But um, just to be very frank, uh, I was not in the category, what you call Bumi category, Bumi Putra category. So therefore, then your choices or options to do law in local universities become more difficult. Uh, so therefore, I, I was told, why don't you do a London external program? Uh, otherwise, I would do history, or economy or something in, in the local university. And I was told by my dad 
those things you can read in a book. You don't have to take a degree. Try to get a skilled job. And unfortunately, we come from very conservative uh, families. So it's either you're a lawyer or you're a doctor or you're an engineer. Those are the kind of options that was given to us. So I decided, OK, I'll take an uh, 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 external program, University of London. That was the uh, option left for us uh, if you want to do privately. And it's when I started reading about, uh, you know, reading law and uh, getting involved in understanding law, that's when I, I thought, okay, this is probably it. Because all this while, I had all kinds of ambition. I wanted to be a scientist, I wanted to be this, I wanted to be that, we wanted to do so many things. But being a lawyer was not really part of the plan. So I guess um, I was thrown in, and and here I am. Right, very interesting. Uh, I, I guess uh, it's safe to say that uh, we have some similarities, because even in the Sikh community, it's always either you become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, and other options are, you know, Limited. It's, it's a no-no. Uh, okay, Miss, uh, you have been a practicing lawyer for almost 20 years. Uh, I believe the viewers want to know, what does a day in the life of a practicing lawyer seem like? Well, things are very different now. Uh, I believe um, as far as since uh, the whole COVID situation where, you know, there's less uh, physical contact, there's less, uh, you know, uh, trips to court. So it's not as, uh, as exciting as you, you would see or you would see in the movies uh, where lawyers actually uh, get to do some action when they go to court. Um, however, uh, things can get busy. It depends on what kind of law practice that you are doing. Uh, you yourself, MJ, you are part of those who actually go to court regularly, and uh, I do too. And if you are the ones who are doing litigation, litigation means cases that are brought to court where you are actually uh, dealing with matters in court as the whole uh, process of uh, adverse, advocacy going on. Um, in that kind of uh, activities, it will be a very, very busy day for lawyers. There's no such thing as nine to five. Um, you meet your client, you got to be prepared, you, you, know, you get ready for, for the case, and then you'll have to read up, you'll have to read up the law, and that's why people say, we practice law. You know, you don't ever you know, finish reading law, you don't ever finish practicing law. Every case is something new for any lawyers because you have to start from the scratch, understanding what happened to this person, um, what's the background, what's the, what's the, you know, the crime or offense that has taken place, what are the laws that are involved, now how do we go about it. So every case is a learning process. So that's how it is for, uh, for, for a lawyer uh, like me or even like you, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, miss, just a, uh, as a very simple question. Do you ever reach that point where you are like, I can't do this anymore? I wish I could say that. <laughs> but I can't because we always have someone who, you know, who would seek our help. Right. Uh, who would always want our, you know, our service. Uh, and I know I sound cliche, but uh, lawyers are not, you know, we're not laborers, we're not workers or businessmen. We are supposed to be part of a noble profession. Just like doctors, we are all bound by certain ethical rules. Uh, you know, we don't do things because it makes money, okay? Uh, so I know there's recent uh, discussion or what's the minimum wage for a lawyer. We're not factory workers. So the reason why we do this is because there's a certain skill, a certain knowledge, and this is a service of a body which is bound by so many rules and ethical rules. So in that context, uh, I don't think you can say I will stop being a lawyer. All right? Uh, unless... What was your objective of being a lawyer? Some people say, I want to be a lawyer because I want to make money. Believe me, you can make more money outside, probably selling ice cream, than being a lawyer. So 
the whole idea is you are supposed to enjoy what you you know what you're doing, and that's the best way to be a lawyer. Be able to uh, actually love what you're doing and believe that you're doing it because of some idealism. All right, because of justice, because of idealism. Talking about uh, idealism and, and justice, uh, in 2011, uh, as, as the viewers can appreciate, uh, Lawyers for Liberty was uh, founded together with uh, uh, YBN Surindran. Uh, could you share how did you end up forming or how did uh, Lawyers for Liberty uh, just come about? Okay, Lawyers for Liberty basically, I mean, <laughs> The name itself was uh, coined over a coffee session with a few young lawyers, a young lawyers like you, and we were taking out all kinds of cases which involves um, death in custody, people who are arrested during a protest, uh, you know, uh, children who are denied citizenship. These are the things that we felt so passionate about, and we didn't want to be. We were just probably free-spirited lawyers who didn't want to be stuck with committees, didn't want to be stuck with, you know, bar council uh, structures and things like that. So we decided, since we are all like-minded and we've been doing this on our own, why don't we just join force and get together right. and start uh, this organization which will help us take up public interest matters. And, uh, and that's how we were. So that's how we came about. And we found out that a lot more people were interested uh, to volunteer. Right. And since we were just a small group, uh, we were free to say what we want. We were not bound by too many bureaucracy. Uh, that's how we came about. So we are seen as a, an alternative to the formal structure of the Bar Council. Right. And it means from the course of uh, uh, assisting victims of injustice, uh, people who are defenseless. I'm sure that you have heard stories, you have uh, experienced it with them. Uh, the experiences that they go through, the victims, does it affect you? It should not. It should not affect us. Uh, going back to why you do law, I would put it back to those uh, who are, you know, um, tuned in for this, for this uh, program. If you were asked to defend someone who has been charged, now, this may, be, this may sound a bit shocking. Let's say someone was charged for raping uh, a, a, an underage girl, all right? And after raping, he killed her. And after killing, he dumped her body. And that person is charged, the question you would ask is, would you defend that person? Now I would like to find out what, right. what is in their mind. Mm -hmm. Another case, let's say, this guy is charged for bombing a school where 100 school children died. Would you defend that person? Now my, quest, my answer to that would be, yes. Because if you start choosing and deciding that your client or that person is guilty and not accord that person the right to trial or the right to have a lawyer or the right to defense, defend himself or herself, then the system breaks down. So if you start thinking emotionally this is not a charity work. This is a legal service. You are there for the justice. Now, if you deny someone like that the right to a fair trial, when the system breaks down, you and I will be denied the same, right. the same thing. Mm -hmm. So one must remember, as a lawyer, regardless of how heinous the crime is, your duty to uh, provide that service is there. It may not be easy. It may not be popular. Mm -hmm. But your job is to prepare the, the person to uh, the right to fair trial and prepare the uh, legal service. And if you can cross that, that thinking, then you can go far. Right. And it's, it's 
at, at the age when you're all still young, and I like to think I'm still young, <laughs> uh, you must have some idealism. You can make money later, right? You can't be idealist. You can't be not idealistic now and try to be idealistic 10, 30 years later. Right. While you have it, use your, you know, your your passion and idealism to do the good things, to fight for justice. Right. And and if you do that, then legal practice, being a lawyer, will be. Trust me, it will be so exciting and it gives you an adrenaline rush right. when you are able to uh, provide that service and, and find justice out of what you did. Uh, I can't describe it. I'm sure MJ you have gone through this where you defended someone who needed the service purely out of the fact that you wanted to help him and give justice, right? right. And, 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 and uh, avoid the injustice that was going to be caused if that person is denied uh, legal service. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like being paid uh, for fees. Right. Uh, I'm not saying go and starve yourself, mm -hmm. but <laughs> when you're young, you should do something out of passion and not out of um, business or money. Right. Uh, talking about uh, passion and justice, uh, I believe uh, we have uh, one very interesting question from, uh, the, I, I saw a question about Lawyers for Liberty. Uh, the question from uh, Andrew Navin, what can we do to improve our critical thinking skills? Right, so a very uh, broad, wide question. Okay, uh, what can we do to improve our critical thinking skills? As lawyers, you will be trained to do that. Without any critical thinking, you can't be a lawyer. And your job is basically to always ask questions. And if you are asking questions, you do actually, as a profession, you'll be doing this all the time. You'll be asking questions from your client, you'll be asking questions in the court, you'll be asking questions even when you are presenting your case later to the judge, you'll be still asking questions. So. The critical thinking process is almost second nature to a lawyer. Right. So uh, it will improve uh, the more you read, the more you, you, you look at the evidence, and, and that's how it's going to be. So don't take anything uh, at face value and accept it. Um, that, then you can't be a lawyer. So it's actually a superfluous question. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to. That is part of your process. Right. Now, Miss. Uh Let's uh, go back to uh, Lawyers for Liberty. Uh, you see, in law school, I believe, uh, or even before we decide, it's always choose a career where the money is. And this goes back to what you mentioned earlier about passion. Uh, and I believe that even in law schools, they always say that, look, as you said, uh, it's not that we go out there to starve, but follow your passion and money will come. So the question is this, what is your advice to lawyers who want to do human rights cases, they want to champion human rights, at the same time they want to make money. Because it's always at the crossroad. Okay, what is human rights cases? It's back to square one, it's the same thing. Whether you're going to uh, represent someone for, um, for being charged, uh, for example, uh, stealing something, or for a person who protested you know, uh, outside the parliament, for example. The process is still the same. You still have to deal with what happened. You still have to look at the papers. You still have to go through the law. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. You see, uh, the rights are all, whether you are uh, arrested for stealing or you're arrested for protesting, the issue of human rights can be whether the person was given the right to access to lawyers, uh, unlawfully, these questions will come about anyway, so it, it really doesn't matter. So, going back to the issue of whether you can make money or not out of these things, um, that's where the idealism comes in. So, if you think you can make money uh, by charging someone for uh, representing someone who is probably, uh, you know, um, who can afford to pay, that's a different issue. 
it's not whether you're doing human rights work or not. It's whether that person can afford to pay or not. Uh, if you do things out of uh, idealism, most of the time you want to do it because you want to do it, not because you're yeah. being paid. Uh, don't worry about it. I would say don't worry about whether you, you, know, you can make money out of it. First, enjoy it. Right. You know? Have fun with it. And then if someone sees you in practice, see you in action, heard your name, they will want you. So I would give one example. Uh, the late Mr. Karpal Singh. If you go to his uh, uh, law firm, those days when he was still alive, you will see his law firm, unlike other law firms, <coughs> was like a clinic. Okay. Queues and queues of people. Everyone wants Mr. Karpal Singh because he is seen to represent the poor. Right. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have rich clients. You see, Karpal is one of those persons who would represent anybody. A person who can be seen as a, a rapist or a, a, a drug trafficker or just a poor, ordinary uh, you know, widow, for example. Karpal will represent. But it depends on whether the person can pay or not. If he's poor, there's no pay. But if the person can afford, there will be pay. That's, that's how Karpal does. So even the richest, probably the most biggest offender would say, I want that Karpal say, because I've seen him. You know, he's seen to represent everybody. He's seen to be the person who dares to speak has to say things in court. That's what they want. They want to see someone speaking on their behalf. Right. So, uh, so if someone sees the, 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 the law firm looking like a public clinic, mm -hmm. they will say, how did he make money? Right? But he, never, he was never poor. Mm -hmm. He was rich in experience. He was rich uh, and loved by everyone. Right. And you can see at his funeral how many people came. It's one of the biggest funeral, you know, attended by so many people of all classes, all sides of the politics, everyone came to his uh, funeral. That's the kind of a uh, lawyer that one should aspire to be. Right. And, and I believe, Miss, you have uh, worked with him on so many, many cases. I had a, not that many, but I had the opportunity to work with him and he was a great man, really a great man. And uh, you can sense the greatness when you're in the same room with him because he's not arrogant. Uh, he's not selfish with knowledge, uh, you know, if you're a junior lawyer, he will share with you how to do things. That's the kind of uh, excitement we had when Karpal was in court, uh, you know, and we get to do all kinds of cases. But, um, of course, I didn't do many with him, uh, but we know of him, we hear of him, you know, and uh, many of us uh, later on, uh, of my generation, um, we would do things and we will look back and like, what would we do, you know, in the way maybe Karpal had done or uh, some other law, uh, senior lawyers, how would they have done? That's why when you're young and when you start, uh, you know, start studying, you are, you know, encouraged to go to court. Look at how the senior lawyers are presenting. The whole advocacy skills. It takes years and years before you actually, um, you know, um, uh, perfect the art of advocacy. It's not automatically you suddenly can speak. Right. That's only in the movies. Okay. <laughs> so r in real life, right. even today, when you stand before a judge, uh, if the case is very important, you will still get butterflies in the stomach. I still get butterflies in the stomach if I have to present an important case where everyone is expecting something. So it doesn't mean that once you are at a certain level you don't feel the fear. You will. But the point is whether you are able to articulate and bring your case and be satisfied that you've done your part and now we leave it to court. Right. You know? Right, Miss. Uh, that was a, 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 an extremely deep insight. Even I, I picked up a few points from that. Miss, a uh, question from Geneve Kaur. Why is it important to look beyond just representing your client and being involved in advocating for justice? and changes within the law? Wow, what a deep question. Extremely yeah. deep question. So I'm trying to figure out. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, because you need the system. 
without the system, if the system fails, uh, then it will affect everybody else. So you take a case, you want to make sure that that particular person has the right to uh, legal service, has the right to you know, question uh, his arrest, his or her arrest. Every step of the way, the system must work. Right. And if the system fails, then the just, uh, there will be injustice. Mm -hmm. So of course it's important. So representing your client, of course it's at, uh, the most important. But apart from representing your client, you need to know whether the system works. Because you're going to be dealing with the system every day. Mm -hmm. Your client finish and is done with. Right. And you have to deal with the next uh, client and the next and the next. So supposing you take a client and the client say, uh, you know, if I pay 10,000, I can let go. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Yeah. I mean, there's corruption everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you start doing that, then you will be known as the lawyer that can settle the, co the courts. Right. Then you can never get to do cases as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You'll just be someone who is known as either a corrupt person or a tout. So similarly, if you get lawyers who say, you know, clients like to ask these questions to you. Can I win? Can you give me a guarantee? Now, if a lawyer actually says, guarantee, 100% I can win. <laughs> Now that's dangerous, huh? No decent lawyer, no ethical lawyer can ever guarantee winning a case 100%. If that is the case, go and check what's the relationship between the lawyer and the judge. Because if, if only there's something so fishy that the lawyer will give a guarantee of 100%. So then the lawyer will say, what about, uh, the client will say, what about 80%, what about 90%? The best answer is, 50-50. Okay? I'll never know. Alright? <laughs> like, I guess uh, things like uh, ethics and principles, there are no two ways about it. No. It's, 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 you have to be ethical, you have to be principled. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, as you were mentioning earlier about uh, Karpal and all, even in your career, you have taken various roles, uh, right from private practice uh, to even politics for a while. And then, uh, most recently, was uh, as the MACC chief. Uh, media attention is uh, bound to happen. It's inevitable. Now, how, uh, just to put it very bluntly, is media a success, media attention? Is it a, a, a pathway to success for lawyers? Of course not. No way. Okay? Right. If lawyers are doing things to get publicity, and the publicity is to show how great the lawyer is. Of course, uh, that is unethical. Eh? Uh, lawyers cannot advertise themselves. But if the media is there to actually, for us to tell what happened in court, and we want more support from the public, for example, in certain ways to, uh, to create a certain uh, interest, public interest, mm -hmm. that is fine. Right. So it's not about... Um, you know, trying to get your case out in, in, in the media for publicity. You can't do that. But if your client feels that he needs support from the public and need public to know so that no, it won't happen to uh, just uh, him or her or but other, other people might want to step forward, that's fine. That, that's okay. Um, speaking to the media, because media also behaves like judges as well, right? So how you would tell the court what is happening. Media has a right to know because media will be uh, the public's access to what's happening in court, right? Not everyone can go to court. But the court is what we call it, a fair court, uh, a modern court, a civilized court will always be an open court. That means it's open to public. So in that context, media will have that role to play to present what is happening in court to, to, the, to the public. So in that, in that way, yes, uh, you can use the media to tell them what is happening. Uh, but don't go there and say, I'm the best lawyer, my case is, you know, my client is so innocent, blah, blah, blah. Don't do that. Right. Okay? It can be very, very embarrassing. <laughs> Miss, uh, we have a question from uh, Rohit Lal. His question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of networking as a lawyer? What is networking? 
we're not in a direct sales uh, <laughs> thing. So I don't know what that means, networking. Um, maybe you want to elaborate? All right, uh, while he's elaborating, maybe you can get him to uh, uh, refine his question. Let's take a question from Gur Amal Pal Singh. Gur Amal Pal Singh. Has there been an instance where due to the hardship faced in the legal profession, the virtue of idealism has somewhat been challenged or de de deteriorated? Of course. Every day you can see. Yeah. Every day if you go to court, you can see lawyers and lawyers. Okay? There will be lawyers who will hang around like touts. You know, uh, basically they will wait to get a client outside. Now, if you go by uh, the rules, um, the legal profession rule, you cannot solicit a, 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 a case or a client. Eh? You know what soliciting means, right? So soliciting means basically uh, you're asking, do you want a lawyer? Do you want a lawyer? It's like some salesman, right? You can't do that. Uh, but you still see it. And of course, the whole legal profession will be tainted uh, if you get your fellow members of the bar doing the same thing and, and, and you hear it all the time. Uh, but it cannot be justified. So the lawyers will say, but I want to make money. How am I going to get clients? Then I would suggest if you have to go to that level, change your profession. Don't be a lawyer and then still try to make money in that manner, then, then that's the wrong profession for you. Maybe you should try something else, maybe business. Right. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it boils down if uh, one lawyer does something, and like what Dr. Rabinder said earlier, you know, a lawyer charged for CBT, yes. then the entire profession yes. goes along. You know? That's right. right. And uh, one I last question is, yes. uh, one last question would be, From uh, Anmol Kaur, what are the three key traits a lawyer should have? Wow, that's a trick question. What are the three, three key traits a lawyer should have? Of course, they, they must have the skill, uh, the knowledge, and the ability to, uh, you know, communicate with either with the client, uh, with, the, with the courts, the ability to communicate is something which we seem to lack sometimes. Um, you know, you may be very knowledgeable in, in a case, in, 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 in the law, but that doesn't mean you are able to impart with it. Okay? Uh, that's why some people, even though they are straight A's, uh, you know, top scorers in uh, the legal, uh, doing LLB, but they may not be the best lawyer because they may be better lecturers, they may be better teachers. Uh, they may be a, a legal journalist, you know, right. but they're not necessarily lawyers. So if you are, a, if you want to be a lawyer that goes to court, you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to uh, understand and make the difference between someone who's telling you a story and someone who is uh, giving you a set of facts. One thing one must remember: lawyers are taught one of the most important tool on how to catch someone lying. Do you know what that is? No. You do know, but you don't realize it. Oh. Okay? How do you know? Only lawyers have been taught that. Okay? That is the key when you do cross-examination. How do you catch someone lying? Because you will be taught how to deal with examination in chief, cross-examination, and re-examination and there's a whole set of rules where you have to follow right so when you ask someone a question then what do you ask them tell the story right examination in chief you tell a story but when you're cross-examining what do you do you don't let the person talk so much right you say either you say yes or no and if they try to explain what do you do hold it you can answer to your to your uh, your lawyer you can explain to your lawyer that tool, that whole process, is a process to identify whether someone is telling the truth or not. Right. Okay? Then the whole set of rules, what evidence, what you know, the evidential rules will come in. A lot of people don't realize that. So 
even to someone ordinary, you're not in the context of a court, when you talk to someone, because you have done cross-examination too many times, or so many times, <laughs> you will catch that person lying. Right. So, next time, when you start practicing, and then your friends or someone tries to lie to you, you can tell them, I make this as, uh, you know, this is, this is how I uh, do for a living. I catch people lying, right? I catch people from, uh, uh, to check whether they're telling the truth. But you won't realize it, but that's what you do, okay? So with the truth, then you go to, uh, basically, uh, you, you do your case. That skill and that tool, only lawyers have it. Right. Right, Miss, uh, I think we have uh, time for one last question. Sure? Going from what you just mentioned, uh, what advice would you give uh -huh. to uh, maybe the school leavers specifically? Because they are now in their, their, their period where they have to decide, do I do law or not? Is there maybe uh, some advice that you can give them that will help them to uh, decide? Very difficult for me to say, but it's uh, do what you you want to do out of passion. Do you want to fight for justice? Do you feel passionate when you see something, uh, you know, out of idealism? It, some people want to be doctor because they want to help the poor. Uh, they want to treat the sick. And you know, during this whole COVID situation, sometimes as lawyers you feel helpless. What are lawyers uh, useful for when people are getting sick? Can you help someone uh, with a virus? So you feel useless. And then they will say, I want to be a doctor so I can help. Similarly, uh, when you're young, you look at what is surrounding you and you think that, you know, it's not fair. Something is happening. Um, you know, why is that person given issued a summons for 10,000 when they didn't do anything? Right. How can we help? Mm -hmm. So if you think I can be a lawyer and take up this matter and I can help, and that's the reason you want to be a lawyer, go ahead and do that. Just don't do things because your parents tell you to do so. <laughs> do something that you feel passionate and, and you think you can help society. Have some idealism. Let it burn. You know, yeah. Have some fire. Otherwise, you know, it's so boring. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you've got to do what you love. Yes. You've got to have a passion yeah. for it. Right. Uh, Ms. Latifa, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. Thank for you for inviting. And, uh, I hope our viewers uh, took back one or two points or tried to back more than one or two. <laughs> and uh, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, now, to all the viewers out there, we have had two speakers. Uh, both the speakers uh, has, have shared with you uh, what it takes, what are the challenges, what are the experiences that you uh, ought to experience later on in life. Now, for our third speaker, we go back, we go back, and uh, she will help you, she will guide you as to how, what is the process, what do I do, do I do A-levels, do I do STPM, do I do a bar in UK, do I do CLP, or do I join one of the local universities where I am exempted from CLP. Now our next speaker is uh, none other than Miss Amrita Kaur. Uh, I believe the law students and maybe the fresh lawyers you all have experienced if you all were in Brickfields Asia College. And uh, she, has, uh, she did her LLB in the University of Malaya. She did her uh, LLM, the Masters in Law from University of Malaya. And currently, she's a, a lecturer in Brickfields Asia College. And uh, I, uh, please join me and let's welcome uh, Ms. Amrita Kaur. for having me, Signal Joints of Malaysia. Uh, thank you everyone who's logged on. Now, um, just help me out a little. I have a screen that I want to share. So I'm gonna click uh, share screen. And uh, I hope that, okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay, am I good to go? Okay, so now, um, Feel free, okay, feel free to send in questions on the chat. 
uh, to everyone uh, who, you have, who have questions. And I know there have already been some questions asked throughout the first two sessions on how do you go about actually getting a law degree. And I've been sent those questions, so I will address those questions at the end of class. Now, I firmly believe that most of your questions I should be able to address with uh, today's presentation. Okay, so let me start off by saying Vaiguchika Kalsa, Vaiguchiki Pate to all of y'all here. Uh, y'all really are some of my favorite people, students. Okay, I'm a teacher by passion. So y'all really are my favorite people. So now, um, today I'm going to, full disclosure before I start. I'm here in between my classes. I have a, this is my lunch hour. I have another class to get to later. Um, so I will have to have a a uh, very strict stop later once my class starts. Now, I'm Amrita Kaur. I did my degree in University of Malaya. Uh, I started in 2008. I graduated in 2012. And then um, I chambered. And after I finished my chambering and I, I was called to the Malaysian bar, I, after that, I didn't practice. I went straight uh, into teaching. I did a little bit of part-time with the University of Malaya. I was tutoring uh, in the law faculty on first year students for family law and final year students for civil procedure. And then I joined Brickfield Asia College at first as a part-timer. And then later on now, I'm pretty much a full-time uh, staff at Brickfield Asia College, where I teach on the UK transfer program I teach on the University of London program. So these two programs are degree programs. And I also teach on the CLP program. I teach criminal procedure and evidence law on the CLP program. So I'm, um, I have a good measure. So whatever I'm gonna tell you comes a lot from uh, personal experience and personal knowledge because I do have the public university end of things. And I also do teach in a private institution. So I do have the benefit of uh, that knowledge as well. Okay, so um, let's get on with it. Okay, so I've prepared this little chart here. Okay, so for any of y'all who might want to avoid some sort of confusion, maybe you want to print screen this, okay, a screenshot this, whatever it is you'll call it. I will also email the slides to the organizers and you can, of course, get it from them. Okay, so this is a very brief uh, outline of how your educational process goes on. Now, can I see a measure of hands? Huh? Because y'all are able to raise hands, right, participants? Now, can I'm going to open my participant list, and if you are able to tell me how many of y'all are not SPM leavers, that means you are either already at your pre-U stage, that means A-levels or uh, STPM or something like that. I will assume the rest of y'all are SPM leavers. Any of y'all? Okay, I have one, one student, two student, two students. Okay, a few. Okay, I have about four students. Okay, great. So... Um, okay, good. So most of y'all are SPM leavers. Congratulations on finally doing your SPM. Huh? We all know it was delayed for a millennia before you got to do it, but great. Okay, so now I'll start off from the SPM stage. Now, after your SPM, which uh, most of y'all are SPM leavers, the thing is you cannot immediately pursue a law degree. A law degree is known as an LLB. Okay, I think uh, it's Latin for legum bachelorus. Okay, so we'll just call it LLB because it's hard to pronounce. So a legal de law degree is known as an LLB. You cannot go from SPM straight to a law degree. That's not allowed. You must have something as a pre-university qualification. Now, there are many options to a pre-university qualification, and we will go through most of them in the next few minutes, okay, in the next few slides. But as an overview, between your SPM to your law degree, you are going to need a pre u qualification. Are we good? You're going to need a pre-university qualification. So this can either be STPM or it can be a foundation program uh, that colleges offer, universities offer. It can be the A-levels program, which in Malaysia is usually the Cambridge A-levels. It can be a diploma, okay, or it can even be the government Kementerian Pendidikan's matriculation. That is also fine. There are a few other options I'll show you all, but basically after SPM, your direct route now is for a pre-university program, okay? Now, 
after you're done with your pre-university program, which takes from anywhere between one to two years, because if you do STPM, it's a year and a half. If you do A-levels, I think there are some places that offer a condensed course that makes it into a year. Otherwise, it can be a year and a half, okay? Because mostly you wait for your results to come out. Also, sometimes it, it ends up taking some time. So it's a year or two years. And then after you're done with your pre-university program, that is when you are able to pursue your degree your degree proper. Now your degree will either take three or four years. Guys, I am going on the basis huh, that nobody fails anything. Okay, I'm, I'm going on that basis that my students here are not going to fail anything. Okay, so a regular degree program will take anywhere between three to four years. Why three or four years, not two, four years. Huh? Three years if you're doing a foreign degree, like a degree in the UK, or even a distance learning, but your qualification is a foreign qualification, it will be three years. Okay, four years is if you do in a public university or somewhere like MMU. All right, it's a it, the reason is because public universities, okay, if you do public university or you do MMU, at the end of your four years, you do not need an additional requirement such as the CLP or the bar. You can straight away chamber. So the thing is, whatever that is learned in the bar or the CLP program, which I will elaborate in a short while, is actually the fourth year of the degree. So if you do a foreign degree, it takes three years and then you'll have to come back and do your CLP or you'll stay on into the bar. So there is that one additional year. Or if you do a local university degree, it will take four years because the additional one year is included in the full measure. Okay, so that will take three or four years. So just know after SPM, how many years it will take you to get to your destination. All right. Now, after you have your degree, after you get your degree, you have many options open. You can either choose to want to become a lawyer or you can choose to not become a lawyer. And that is fine because uh, there are many careers open to law graduates. We have seen already today two wonderfully accomplished individuals that have given you a small talk and I have helped uh, uh, Mr. Marjot has conducted an interview with them and this should show you how far you can go with the law degree. So there are many options. If you don't become a lawyer, it's fine. There are many work options you can go for. We will explore a few careers later. And if you want, you can also further your studies before you go on to work in whatever course you want. You can take uh, your master's, okay? You can either do your LLM, which is your master's in law, or you can do any other master's because once you have a law degree, a lot of other MBAs, um, a lot of other master programs are open to you. You can do professional courses. You can go on to do an accounting course. You can do a company secretary course. You can do SEMA, ACCA. All of this will uh, be options for you to have if you want or not. And also you can do short courses to specialize in certain areas if you want. Okay, but the point is, if you don't want to become a lawyer, you either create a niche in education, such as, sorry, you, uh, you develop your niche through education, that means you educate yourself, that means you further your studies, or you immediately start with work. But if you want to become a lawyer, if you want to become a lawyer, all right, then you really have to ask yourself, where was your degree? If your degree was in a public university or MMU, then you can immediately chamber okay chambering is where you spend nine months learning from a lawyer okay so at the end of these nine months learning from this lawyer in his practice and doing a lot of work um, the lawyer will basically recommend to the bar that you are ready to become a lawyer yourself Okay, so at the end of the chambering, you will become a member of the bar. You'll be called to the bar and you will become a member of the bar. So you don't need any additional requirement if you went to a public university or you went to MMU because like Benji explained just now, these two uh, venues that offer their degrees to you are usually four years. So in the fourth year is included already everything additional that you need to know. Okay, whereas if you pursue a foreign degree, okay? Whereas if you pursue a foreign degree, sorry, my cursor went missing. If you pursue a foreign degree, which would have taken you three years, okay? Before you become a lawyer, you must either take the CLP, which is the Certificate of Legal Practice, 
All right, CLP is the Malaysian Certificate of Legal Practice. Or you must go and enroll and pass the English bar. And when I say English bar, I don't mean the language. I mean the nation, okay? Um, the UK bar, basically. All right? And this usually takes a year. If you get it right on the first go, you don't fail anything and all, this will take a year. Are we clear? Any questions at this juncture? I hope not. All right, so this is an overview of it. Now we'll go into the details of each process. Okay, we'll highlight the benefits and uh, the downfalls of each type of uh, choice you can make at every juncture, at the pre-U juncture, at the degree juncture. We will highlight each option you have, okay? And if you have questions, please ask, all right? But I do believe that most of your questions will be answered by the end of class. Yeah? Okay, now this is a big reminder. I know it's a lot of words, but it's a very big reminder. Now, whichever pathway you choose, always ensure to keep your career options open. Now, I go back to the previous slide. Huh? Now, we can see here in terms of career, you can either become a lawyer or don't become a lawyer. And I know I make don't become a lawyer sound very boring by putting the word work here. But there are many career options you have here. But let me offer you some advice. You will not be able to decide whether you want to be a lawyer or not want to be a lawyer before you finish your degree. Okay, let's be very honest. I'll be very honest with you all. You will not be able to make this decision before you finish your degree. So that means whatever decision you make today, okay, whatever decision you make today, I want you to ensure that this decision on the pathway you will follow will keep the option of becoming a lawyer open. All right, now, this basically translates to whatever option you take today. Make sure you are able to do the CLP. Unless, of course, it's MMU and public universities. Huh? If you do a foreign degree, please ensure you keep your option to take the CLP open. That means whatever pre-university program you carry on now, make sure it is recognized by the legal profession qualification board because this is the board that sets the CLP exam and admits people to the profession. Okay, it is the board that, uh, that allows you to be qualified to join the legal profession. I mean, the name says it on legal profession qualifying board. Okay, so make sure whatever foundation, whatever A-levels, STPM, whatever you do, make sure it is recognized by the legal profession qualifying board. Okay, because this went, and then later when you do your degree, make sure your degree is also recognized by the legal profession qualifying board. Don't ever say, ah, we didn't know. Benji tell you already now. Okay, you must make it your business, not your college's business, not my father's business, not your mother's business. It must be your business, all right, to ensure that you ask the right questions. When you go and enroll in any college, I'm from BAC, but you can enroll in any college, huh? wherever you go, make sure it is one which is recognized by the LPQP. Okay? I cannot stress this enough. Huh? Okay. All right. Now, since we are looking at the LPQB qualifications, just a very boring slide here right now, at the SPM stage, okay, at the SPM stage, all right, the minimum you need to entitle you to take, uh, to enable you to take the CLP exam and therefore become a lawyer is you need five credits at the SPM level. Okay, five credits at the SPM level. Credit is C. Okay, credit is a C. And you can look at the additional requirements in this website here. Okay, I will email this slide to the organizers. They can uh, shoot it out to all of you. Okay, so in the LPQB website, the uh, Legal Profession Qualifying Board website, there is written in detail what the qualifying requirements are at each stage. Okay, so at SPM, there is a need to be uh, have at least five credits. Now, what if you didn't do SPM? Okay, what if you get, uh, what you did your IGCSE and things like that? Okay, now when it comes to the IGCSE, if I uh, remember correctly for the student who's just asked Bajneet Kaur, okay, if you click this uh, link, it will show you that um, it has to be in one certificate or something like that. The five credits have to be in one certificate. But please, 
uh, LTQB is located in uh, KL, in the heart of KL. Feel free to call them and get the correct information, uh, correct confirmation, not inferring, correct confirmation on whether or not your options are open. But according to my reading of these requirements, it says one certificate for other equivalent to SPM qualifications. Okay, SPM five credits and equivalent, I think, is uh, in one certificate or one sitting, something like that. Okay, all right. So let's move on now. Your immediate concern right now is going to be pre-university because like we saw in the slide just now, after SPM, your next step is pre-university. Okay, so there are a host of programs available to you on the pre-university stage. There is STPM. This is um, Sijil Tinggi Pelajaran Malaysia. This is Form 6, as a lot of you all know. I did STPM. I'm a full Malaysian graduate, okay, from Kebangsaan School to STPM to public university, my master's also in public university. I'm a full Malaysian graduate. So if you have any question on the, um, on the, on the veracity, on the strength of Malaysian education, let me be your measure. It's good. As long as you put in the effort and you do other great things outside, it's good because school is only a few hours in a day. What, what you do outside also matters. So STPM is one option as a pre-university. Now I put STPM on the very top huh? because it's my personal preference. It's, it doesn't have to be your preference. It's my personal preference. I'll tell you why STPM was my personal preference. I did not know what I wanted to do after SPM. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Okay, so I needed a little bit more time to grow up, to figure out what I wanted to do in life, and I did not want to do it on my parents' money. Let's, we are all almost adults here, so let's be very frank. I'll be very frank with you on what should be your considerations. I did not want to figure out what I want in life on my parents' money. So I didn't want to go to college and do A-levels on a bunch of subjects which I wasn't sure what I was going to do. STPM seemed like two years, one and a half years, okay, that I could use in school. I didn't even have to buy a new uniform. I had the uniform already from school. I even knew which school it was. It was my own high school, okay. I knew the teachers and I did STPM. It is very cheap, okay. So the biggest um, benefit of STPM is it is probably your cheapest option. All right, you just basically pay school fees kind of thing, a few ringgit, no, few, few hundred ringgit for exam fees, but it is not an expensive affair, okay? So you usually do it in a government school, it's your cheapest option. The exam is centralized, that means all of Malaysia goes through a centralized exam. STPM right now has a, a part, part of it is like continuous assessment, like coursework. And then I think about 80% is still an exam. So there is still a large portion of it, which is a centralized exam. Okay, so all of Malaysia goes through STPM. Now, the other benefit of doing STPM is it includes the possible entry to a public university. Now, even if you do any of the other programs, you can still get into public university, can absolutely can but if you do stpm okay it is one of those uh, common routes to public university so if any of you all have the intention of joining public university stpm is a good option many public university entries are through stpm okay all right now the second option you have during pre-university okay the second option you have during pre-university is a foundation program now, a foundation program is ensure your foundation program in your selected college or university huh, is one which is recognized by the Ministry of Education. Okay, it must be recognized by Ministry of Education and it's accredited by the Malaysian Qualifications Agency. How do you determine this? You ask the college. You ask the college outright. All right. Are you recognized? Is your foundation program recognized or not? Okay, now the reason this is so important is because if it is not recognized, you cannot take CRP data. Okay, so we must ensure that you keep your career options open. So whatever you take has to be one that will keep your career options open. Now, I have seen students come to BAC from other colleges before. Okay, and the foundation they did in their previous college is not one which is accredited. So when they come over, they cannot start their degree program. They still have to do another pre-university program, otherwise they close their doors to CRP. 
Okay, so wherever you start, make your decisions right. Wherever you start, whichever foundation program you use, make sure it's accredited. Now, the benefits of a foundation program is this. When you do a foundation program, you are likely to do a foundation in law program. Okay, it's likely to be a foundation in law program. So it the foundation program is already law focused. You already get exposure to the law during your foundation program itself. Okay. Now, the other thing is that the examinations are not centralized. Every college or university that offers a foundation program will have their own program. They will set their own exams. They will assess you themselves. Okay. Some will have examination heavy foundation programs. Some will have continuous assessment heavy uh, foundation programs. That means it's coursework. You learn through several assignments and things like that. Excuse me, uh, this is my fourth hour of lecture already. Water is needed. And yes, this is how I do my lecture. I talk to my students like this as well. Okay, so I hope you all don't mind. Now, um, so that is actually the benefit of a foundation program. It is internally set, it is internally assessed, and it is law focused. Okay, it is law focused. Now, it is also it also has the function as feeding into the degree program. Okay, it also has the function of feeding into the degree program. So if you join a certain college or university for a foundation program, it is likely that you will pursue your degree with the same college as well. Okay, so it helps you build a sense of familiarity from the beginning to your venue, your premises or your education as a whole. Okay, now the other available pre-university program all right. Sorry, I'm going to take a bit of time on this because most of y'all are SPM neighbors. Okay. This is your first hurdle. This is your most immediate decision you have to make. Another option is A levels. Now, A levels is usually the one that is offered here is the Cambridge A levels. I will also recognize that uh, there is also the Singapore A levels and things like that. Okay. But um, now, what you need for A levels to pursue a degree is actually two credits or something like that. You need two passes. So the minimum you can take, all right, in A-levels is two subjects. Of course, we have students who take four subjects. Now, the students who take four subjects, these are students who are hoping to do really well in their four subjects and then get a scholarship for their degree, okay? Because I have uh, one of my cousins, uh, uh, not my cousins, one of my uh, people I know, Okay, he did really well in his A-levels, four subjects, he took all A's or A-stars or something like that. And then he got a full ride scholarship to do his degree abroad. So people who take more than a two, right, are usually those who are going for excellence and they are pursuing a scholarship. Okay, otherwise, if you're already set to fund your own uh, uh, education, then a minimum of two subjects is sufficient. So I have students who take A-levels law and they also take A-levels economics or they take A-levels business or something like that, okay? Or, so they will take two subjects, all right? So in the A-levels law subject, you get exposure to the law and then you have another subject that uh, whatever it is you pick that is available to you, okay? Now, the examine, the syllabus is set by Cambridge. I mean, Cambridge University, huh? Okay, Cambridge University, the exams are set, the syllabus is set by Cambridge, the exam is set by Cambridge, Cambridge ships the papers over, and then the students take the papers, and then the papers is sent back to Cambridge for marking. So everything is done by Cambridge, you simply study in Malaysia, and you take the exam in Malaysia, but the paper is sent by Cambridge, is marked by Cambridge as well. Okay, now this is what it used to be until COVID hit everybody. When COVID hit everybody and the period when COVID hit, it was nearly exam. So for the COVID year, uh, Cambridge had to do some change changes. So in the COVID year, what happened was uh, Cambridge asked the universities or the colleges that provided the education for uh, A-levels to assess the students themselves and then submit those assessments to Cambridge, and then Cambridge reviewed those assessments, and then they came to somewhat of a joint decision-ish, okay? There was a, that was that. But that was what happened because of COVID. But otherwise, Cambridge takes care of the syllabus, the examination, the marking, everything, okay? Now, the other, op uh, so A-levels and foundation programs are usually found in colleges, okay? They are usually found in colleges. Now, the other option is matriculation. 
Matriculation is by Kementerian Pelajaran Malaysia. Now, the benefit of matriculation is this. It includes a possible entry to public university. Now, A-levels also can go into public university, yeah? can ah? Okay, but matriculation is a big feeder into public universities. So many public university students come from the matriculation stream. So if you can get into matriculation, it is said, it is said, uh, it is said that uh, it is not too difficult to get into university after that. Okay, public university. Okay, now the difficulty with matriculation is matriculation still runs on a very strong quota system. And we being uh, non-Muslims, uh, me at least, okay, uh, it is difficult for us to get into matriculation, but it is not impossible. So I would encourage all of y'all uh, to at least try, to at least try, okay? Because if you can get into public university, the fees you pay, the fees you pay for your education is very small. Now, let's be honest, huh? Benji, be very honest with you. I went to University of Malaya for my degree. Do you know what my fees was? I studied four years, huh? Four years means eight semesters, half, 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 half. Each year got half, right? Benji studied eight semesters. Do you know what my tuition fees for each semester was? I was a public university student. It was so small, my father refused to let me take a scholarship all alone. My fees for one semester was 700 ringgit only. That means in less than 5,000 ringgit, I paid my entire tuition fees already for four years. The balance I paid because I stayed on campus, 10 ringgit a day only. Now it's less. Okay? That is it. All right? That is it. That is why um, if you can get into public U, I would suggest you try to get into public U. Because if you get into public U, instead of the private entries, the actual public entries, right, through matriculation and STPM and even A-level sometimes, the fees is small. The fees is very small. And I'm a product of UM. It's a good education. Okay? It's a very good education. So that is why I always would encourage you to try for matriculation. If you get it and you don't want to go, never mind. If you don't get and you cannot go, also never mind. There are many other options. But don't throw it out the window by not trying. Now, there are other things that you can do to get into pre-university, such as a diploma, uh, international bachelorette program, you have a first degree. All these are also things you can do as not to get into pre as a replacement of pre-university. So if you have a diploma, then there is no need for pre-university. The diploma will serve as your pre-university qualification. Or if you did IB, uh, that would serve as your pre-university uh, 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 qualification. Or if this is not your first degree to do law, law is not your first degree, it's your second degree. If I have any senior students here, okay, your first degree will basically exempt you from the need for doing pre-university. Okay, so, now, these are the options available. Now, again, I remind you, always check if your pre-university uh, program is recognized by LPQB. Now, the options I have given are all recognized options, okay? Um, and you, this, you can see it at this website, okay? The LPQB website has many, many things there. This is it. Now, what you need in order to qualify to do CLP later, that means, guys, now that you start your pre u uh, your minimum that you must get is you must get two principal passes. That means you must get two passes at SPM level, okay? Or it's equivalent obtained in one and the same examination. Are we good? Okay, now I trust all of y'all will be able to do better than just pass. Okay, better than just pass. But that is what you need. Okay, you need to at least pass. Can? Now, if you fail, I don't know why you're trying to do law, lah, huh? but you have to at least pass. All right, so I just show you all again. These are some of the options in pre-university. Are we good? Can. Okay. Now, once you finish your pre-university and you want to pursue your degree, are you all okay? Is everyone okay? I've had not one response. Are you all all right? Can, ah? Huh? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, oh, are you learning so much? You're soaking up so much information. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I'll take it as you're like learning so much, you cannot ask me any questions. Okay, now, on the degree program, the degree, the LLB itself, there are many options. 
Now, these are the options for you to study locally. That means you don't have to leave the country. This does not necessarily mean you get a Malaysian degree. Huh? Okay. This is you study locally. That means you don't have to leave the country. And then there are leaving the country abroad options as well, which we will discuss. Okay. Now, if you want to study locally, because you perhaps cannot secure a scholarship or you cannot uh, afford to pay yourself, or you don't want to take such a voluminous loan, a PTPTN loan, you don't want to take such a big loan that you have to pay off for years and years of your life, you want to not have to incur so much money, a good option is to study locally. Now, there are a few options to study locally. One would be public universities. Now, remember public universities, the education is for four years. You will be learning Malaysian law syllabus. Okay, now the lectures in UM are done in English. In most public universities, they're also done in English and then tutorials are in Malay. There's a mixture of the language. Okay, it's not to say you are taught in Malay fully, fully. No, most of your lecturers are so proficient in English anyway. Okay, and the law is found a lot in English instead of Malay. Even Malaysian judgments, most of them are written in English. Okay, most Malaysian judgments are written in English. So don't worry so much uh, on a, um, a language issue. In public universities, we still use English. Now, uh, it's four years and most public universities do not require CRT examinations, but you can check the LPQB website on which uh, are recognized. The thing is, I think there are only about six public universities that offer a law degree and all six of them are recognized by uh, the LPQB. So you don't need a CLP. It's already four years and done. I think one of the last ones to join was uh, UUM, the one in Kedah. University Uttara Malaysia, maybe UNISA after that, but yeah, UUM, okay? So to get into public university, you have to make a UPU application, all right, under the Ministry of Education, all right? Now, the thing is, this is the website. The application for public university closes in a few days. Can you do me the favor of at least checking it out on this website? It closes in a matter of three or four days, huh? Please do me a favor, do yourselves a favor of just checking it out. This is especially important for my students who are not SPM leavers, who are STPM leavers or something for uh, something equivalent to STPM, and you want to keep your options with public universities open. Please check the UPU applications. Okay. All right. Now the next step to take. Okay, the next step to take. Sorry, not the next step. The next option on a, deg uh, a degree is the multimedia university. Now, the multimedia university is not a public university. That means it's not a government-funded university. Okay, it is a private university, but it offers a four-year law degree. It teaches you Malaysian law syllabus, and it does not require the CRP exam. Okay, so it is a brilliant option if you do not want to take the CRP exam. Can? Okay, so just go through MMU's website, Multimedia University MMU, just go to their website and check their enrollment, call one of their people, you will get in. Not get in, you will be able to talk to their people to see if you're able to get in. It's a good option to have in mind. Okay, so these two you study in Malaysia fully. I think MMU's campus is in Malacca. Public universities are all over the country in different, different places. Okay, UM is in KL, uh, UUM is in, um, UUM is in Kedah, uh, UITM I think is in the Gombak Selayang area. Okay, so these are all in Malaysia. Now, the next one we have here, okay, before I go to University of London, um, you have Taylor's University and Help University. Taylor's University and Help University also have recognized law degrees, their own degree. You get the degree from the University of Taylor's University, or you get the degree from Help University. So your degree is from Taylor's, or it's from Help. Okay, so they have their own degree program. Okay, do they also offer other options for a law degree? Perhaps, but they also have their own law degree program. So this one, I will leave it to you all to check with Taylor's and help give them a call, ask, ask them what is their fees, uh, what syllabus they teach you and all of these things. Okay. Now, the most, uh, the other very common degree that is pursued by those students who cannot go abroad or don't want to go abroad is known as the external degree from University of London. Now, University of London is in London. Okay, it offers an external degree. That means, uh, what it means is this. 
The syllabus is set by University of London. The exam is set by University of London. You register with University of London. You are given the degree from University of London, but you study in Malaysia. You study in Malaysia. You don't have to go to University of London to study. Okay, now University of London degree is probably the only external degree that is recognized by LPQB in Malaysia. Okay, so what you will find in Malaysian colleges is when they offer you the UOL, the UOL program, University of London program, they are providing you with classes to learn the syllabus. So the local colleges do not provide you with the exam or the syllabus what no this is all coming from london all right it all comes from london and then we will teach you according to the ul set syllabus i teach on the ul program i teach third year i teach uh, evidence law it is english syllabus english uk law syllabus okay is uk law syllabus not malaysian syllabus it's uk law syllabus they send the syllabus to all the students and the teachers we teach you so that you are able to take the exam set by University of London. Now, if you don't want to enroll in a college, it's up to you. You can self-study as a champion, no problem. I've had a friend who did self-study, okay, a friend, my peer. Or you can sign up with a college and the college will teach you the law, okay? You'll be studying English law. Now, the thing is, you must take CLP if you take University of London. You must take CLP. UL is a three-year course. If you don't fail anything and you move according to pace, it's three years. At the end of the three years, if you want to practice in Malaysia, be a lawyer in Malaysia, you must take your CLP. And as you do your UOL syllabus, you must make sure you obtain at least a second class lower degree. Okay, a second class lower degree. Third class cannot take CLP. That is a... Uh, uh, one thing that makes UL a bit of a turnoff for some students who already know that they're not very uh, good with academics. So they are already expecting to fail. Now the truth is, if you're already expecting to fail, why are you doing this course? Go and do something that you won't fail. Go and do something that you will be interested to study and you'll be interested to put in the time and make sure you pass. Okay, so the difficulty with UL is that for CRP, there is a minimum grade required, which is a second class lower. But the truth is, students, put in the effort, be consistent. A second class lower is completely feasible. The highest grade is a first class. Less than the first class is a second class upper. Then only a second class lower. It's the third grade from the top. It's not the first or the second. Okay, it is completely feasible as long as you put in the effort. Okay, now so in BSc I teach UL, all right. So I know the what the syllabus looks like, and when I tell you it is completely feasible, I mean it. Okay, so these are your degree options. These are your degree options. Can perfect. All right, let's move on. Just the moment I get my cursor to work. Okay. All right. Now abroad, if you want to go abroad and study, okay, you may either join a twinning program which is either a 1 plus 2 or 2 plus 1. What does this mean? 1 plus 2 means you do one year in Malaysia and then you do two years abroad. All right? Now, if you do um, a twinning program, which is 2 plus 1, you do two years in Malaysia and you do one year abroad. Now, the thing is, uh, most of the twinning programs offered in Malaysia are to UK universities. But you can also go to other countries. You can go to Australia as well. APQB recognizes some Australian universities as well. Okay, so these are available options. Twinning program is 1 plus 2 or 2 plus 1. Now, remember the time you spend in the UK. Okay, the time you spend in the UK every day uh, costs money. So make sure you can afford to do it or you can take a loan or you can get a scholarship for it. Okay, so why is it called twinning? Because you twin between your local studies and your, sorry, your local education, which is the year you spend in Malaysia. Or, and then you also add it on with the time you spend in the UK. Now, the degree that you get, which university gives you the degree? It is the foreign university that gives you the degree. It's not the local college or university that gives you the degree. Huh? It is from the foreign university. So say you do a twinning with University of Liverpool, your degree is from Liverpool itself, from University of 
Liverpool. Okay, so the time you spend in Malaysia, the one year or the two years you do in Malaysia, what happens there? Okay, now the syllabus is set by your Malaysian college with consultation with the UK universities. So the UK universities must approve your college set syllabus. They must approve your college set standards. I know this because I also teach on the, uh, the training programs in BAC and we have, uh, we have our foreign university representatives, the lecturers from every university, one or two come down every year and they go through our syllabus, our examination questions, our standards for marking. They go through all of this and then they approve. And only when they approve, they allow the students to come into their universities. They approve. Okay, they approve. Okay, so you don't have to worry. Now, so, but nonetheless, it is set by your college. It is a thought by a college. It is examined by a college. It is marked by a college. And then the scores may be remitted to the foreign university. Okay? So this is a big contrast between UOL, the University of London, and a twinning degree. University of London, throughout every year, first year, second year, third year, entirely, uh, syllabus is set by University of London, exam is set by University of London, exam is taken in Malaysia, but papers are shipped back to University of London for marking purposes. So University of London does the marking. It takes care of the whole thing for the entirety of the time. The rest twinning programs, the years you spend in Malaysia, the exams, the syllabus, everything is set by your college. Your college will mark it, will teach you everything. Okay? And only when you go abroad for your final year or your, if you're doing one plus two, then the last two years, that's when you will be in the university. The university will set the syllabus for that subject and they will assess you and they'll mark and everything. Okay? Now, if you are a hero, you can go fully abroad. Okay, you can go fully abroad. You can spend all three years abroad. Now, this is, of course, for someone who has the finances to do so. Or you get a scholarship. You get a scholarship and then you go fully abroad for all three years. Okay, so these are your LLB options. I just show you again. Huh? Locally, it's public universities, MMU. Or you do the external program, which is University of London, or you go and inquire with tailors and help university on what their requirements are. All right. Now, I know tailors and help is allowed because I checked the LPQB website and they showed the degree from tailors and from help. So I know these are two options you can also consider. Otherwise, if you don't want to do University of London, Public Uni, MMU, or go anywhere else, you can do a training program. So the perk of a training program is you go abroad. Okay, is you go abroad. All right. So now please again ensure it is uh, recognized by LPQB. Okay, and also check if it is exempt. Okay, so what is recognized by LPQB and exempt from CLP is listed here, and it is basically public university and MMU. All right. Then you have in this link. Recognized by LPQB, but you must take CLP. Okay, the degree is recognized. That means the university you go to is recognized, but you must take CLP. Okay, now let's see. Do you all have any pressing questions? Okay, now law graduate to lawyer. Once you do your LLB, okay, once you do your LLB, you become a law graduate. Not you become a lawyer, you become a law graduate. Now, the journey from a law graduate to a lawyer, okay? All right? The journey from a law graduate to a lawyer is quite the journey. Now, unless it is public uni or MMU, if public uni or MMU, the moment you get your law degree, you are done. You can go in chamber. After you chamber, you can be called to the bar already. There is no additional step you need to take, okay? But if you did not do public uni or MMU, but you went into a private college or private university, okay, you did UOL or things like that, then you either have to pass the CLP or you have to be called to the English bar. Okay, now CLP is set by LPQB, Legal Professional Qualifying Board. It is in Malaysia. 
you learn Malaysian law, okay, you learn procedural subjects basically, okay, you learn Malaysian law, procedural subjects, it is fully exam based, all right, and if you don't fail nothing, one year you will finish, CLP, one year you will finish, are we good? Okay. The other option is the English bar. The English bar, if you have been called to the English bar, it is recognized in Malaysia. You don't have to take CRP. You absolutely don't have to take CRP. Okay. So it is in the UK. It is exam and practical. So it's got examinations. It's also got practical. It is split up in a lot of uh, different blocks. Okay. It is also one year if you don't have any failure problems and all. And it is recognized in Malaysia. So if you do the bar, you don't have to take CLP after that. You just come home and chamber. So these are the options. Now, I just show you back this slide to help you understand. Okay. So from SPM, your next hurdle is pre-university. After pre-university, you have to take a, you get your degree. And when you get your degree, please look out whether you did a public university or MMU, then you don't need any additional requirements. You can straight away go in chamber. If you took a foreign degree, you have to either do the CLP or the UK. Right? And it takes one year. If you don't want to be a lawyer, it's fine. Now, before I go on to the next slide, which, okay, never mind. Let's go to the next slide. Careers. And then it's already thank you. Okay. Now, the careers available to you. Uh, if you want to practice law, that means you want to be a lawyer proper. If you want to be a lawyer proper, you can either be a lawyer which litigates or does not litigate. So if you be a lawyer that goes to court and fights cases in courts, you are known as a litigator. Okay, but that is not the only type of lawyer there is. There are lawyers who manage companies' mergers. There are lawyers that uh, do land matters. There are lawyers which uh, do other things such as um, industrial things, okay? So they are lawyers who draft contracts and ensure their contracts are done right because if it's done right, you don't need to go to court, okay? So I always like to say that lawyers who go to court and don't go to court are equally important. The reason being, if the lawyer who doesn't go to court has done his job right, there is no need to go to court. You go to court, okay? Sometimes you end up in court because the lawyer who's not supposed to go to court did not do his job right. For example, if you draft a contract, if you as a lawyer draft the contract right, there is nothing unclear, everything is good, it is in line with the law, there will be no need for you to go to court over this contract. But if you do a bad job drafting the contract, words are unclear, they are ambiguous, they can be given multiple meanings, okay? There are uh, issues which are not covered by the contract. Then in that situation, you'll have to go to court. You'll have to get the court to decide the matter for you. So my point is this, okay, I've given very poor examples of non litigating lawyers, I'm aware of that. Okay, my point is, if you become a lawyer, you don't always have to go to court, you can do non court going jobs as well as a lawyer. Okay, besides becoming a lawyer, you can also be a prosecutor. Now a prosecutor is also like a lawyer, but basically you work with the attorney general's chambers. So you work for the ginger and shimmers, yeah, I just said that. You become a public prosecutor, which very few of us will become, okay? Or you become one of the deputy public prosecutors. So you basically will charge people. You are the officer, uh, you are the lawyer who charges, the prosecutor who charges people for crimes. And then on the other end, the accused person will have a defense lawyer who is a litigating lawyer. Okay, now the Attorney General's Chambers does not only cover public prosecutors, okay, or deputy public prosecutors. There are also civil actions, which I have not written here. You can be a federal counsel, okay, so you deal with civil actions. So not criminal things, but even non-criminal things, uh, the state still needs lawyers. Or you can join the drafting department of the AG's Chambers where you draft new laws, okay? And don't forget, another way to say you're practicing law is if you become a judge okay so you're not a lawyer in a sense that you're not practicing law as a lawyer but you are still well within the realm of the law because you are a judge now if you don't want to actually become a lawyer now to become all of this huh, you must become a lawyer okay so either you did public uni mmu or you did your clp or you did your english bar okay you must do that these career options keep them open always 
Okay. Now, besides becoming a lawyer, you there are many more things. These are so few things I've listed. There are many more things you can do. Okay. You can join a company and become their in-house legal team. You can join advisory. Advisory has nothing to do with the law. But when you study the law, your mind opens. And if you make sure your mind opens when you study law, that means you care to study properly. When you join advisory, that means you will manage people's problems. The legal education that you had, not so much the law itself, but the mindset you develop through your legal education will be very helpful. Okay, I have people from my universities who now run their own advisory firms. Now, you can also teach like me. Okay, you can become a businessman. Definitely, I have friends who are now businessmen, businesswomen, because with their legal education, their brain grew, okay, tremendously. You can join politics. I have so many lawyer friends who are in politics, okay, so many who are in politics. You can also become the president, okay, or prime minister. Now, this uh, may not be very feasible for us in Malaysia, but just to let you know, Malaysia's first three prime ministers were lawyers and 26 U.S. presidents, okay, 26 U.S. presidents are lawyers, all right? On top of that, you can do diplomatic relations and you can also join the police and there are many, many, many more things you can do, okay? So, is the end of my presentation with y'all okay thank you i just want to let y'all know i teach at breakfast asia college where we offer a levels we offer foundation in law and many more things uh we offer uk transfer which is the twinning we do university of london and we also do crp penji teaches on this three okay i teach on this three that is my doorbell okay and just so you all know that there is an open day happening right now i give you all a moment to take this down and then in a minute all right, in a minute, let's go and uh, tackle. Um, in a minute, we will tackle the questions that you have given me. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the questions that you have for me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Such a bad flag. Okay, so some of the questions that you have for me. Let's see. Huh? If I cannot answer, I'll tell you flat I cannot answer, but I'll tell you where the answers will be. Okay? Now, Miss, I have a question. I'm doing a diploma policing and investigation. Is that I have a chance to do a degree in law or do I have a foundation in law? Then only do a degree in law. Well, according to LPQB's website, if you have a recognized diploma, you already have a recognized diploma, you don't have to do a foundation in law. You can pursue your degree immediately. Okay? Um, so, uh, but, 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 have this in mind. Do your research. Check the LPQB website. The links are in this, uh, in this um, presentation. Okay, and go with the information to your relevant college and ask your college, I already have a diploma, do I have to? And make sure they answer whether you have to or they encourage you to. Because if they encourage you to, perhaps it's not something you need to do, but they simply want you to do. Okay, so if you don't have to, all right, then you don't have to. You don't need to. Okay. Next one from Ruplin Kaur. So if everyone can open the chat, then uh, we can see together the questions, all right? Hi, I'm uh, I'm in Form 2. Oh dear, you're very young, darling. I'm just curious on which stream do I take when I'm in Form 4 and which subjects should I do to do law? Okay, very good question, darling. Now, I personally was in the science stream throughout. Okay, Form 1 to Form 5, and you was in the science stream, pure science, biophysics, chemistry. And then in Form 6, I did arts. I did pengajian uh, am, economics, mathematics, and literature in English. You see my funny combination? And with this combination, I got into public university. So the thing is, uh, in my university, in my colleges, everywhere, I have students from every stream doing every possible thing. So if your school is such, I give you advice, okay? In my school, if you are one of the brightest students, you take the science stream. Why? Because the way the school streams the students is, if you're bright, they put you in science stream. If you're 
average, they put you in uh, the non-science streams. They used to do that. So if you want to make sure that your classmates are with you and they challenge you throughout, then you will definitely go to the science stream because you do not want to put yourself in the art stream because then you will be with other students who may not be too interested in studying because we're all about full disclosure, right? That was the pattern in my school. Okay, so you look at the pattern in your school. If that is such, I would suggest you stay in the best stream that you can. But the point is, you can decide to do law even if you did pure science. Absolutely can. No problem at all. Okay, next question. Is it worth to do your master's in law? If so, why? Now, I did my master's in law because I am a teacher and I have to do it. Okay, I did my master's in law um, while I worked, I was working at night, I'll go for a master's class. I was also planning my wedding at the same time. I would say it was quite a torturous time in my life. Okay. <laughs> so I will say that you do your master's in law if it will enrich your career. If it will enrich your career or it will enrich your life in any way. Because the truth is some of the best lawyers out there do not have a master's in law so you don't need to do your master's in law but if you're looking to learn a little more before you step out into your working life or if while you're working you feel you're growing a little stagnant in knowledge and you want to go back to learning because some people enjoy learning then go ahead and do your master's but it is not something that you need to do also if it is offered as a by the way program to an existing program then why not Okay, then why not? Such as the question from Bhavdeet, which says, I have a friend that's doing his LLM and BPTC in 12 months, one year. Okay, what did I do? I stopped share. Okay, never mind. Who is doing the LLM uh, together with the BPTC. Now, since this is a conjoint program, okay, it is already designed to be something that you can do at the same time. So there is no harm in doing it together. Okay, there's no harm and it's not too difficult to do. It is designed to allow the movement of the knowledge between the two that you are doing. So in that situation, I'll say go for it. Why not do your LLM and the BPTC together? But if you're already working and then you want to take time out to do your master's, well, really ask yourself, am I really interested to study for the next two years? And is this going to help me in my life? Okay. Next question, which is better option? Study in Malaysia or study abroad? Well, I am a full Malaysian law graduate. I think studying in Malaysia is a good option. It is good on your pocket as well. The loan you take is much smaller if you don't want to burden your parents as well, which, by the way, are under no obligation to fund your education huh? under the law. You, they don't have to pay for your tertiary education. Okay, you're already like 18 when it starts kind of thing. You're legal adult already. If you don't want to spend too much, study locally. If you want to get a UK degree, do the University of London program. Okay. Um, otherwise, go abroad. If you can afford it, if you want it, it is something you like, go for it. Okay. Now, I um, next question. Sorry, Miss, I will explain again. My line was lagging. Okay. Never mind. I will wait for his second explanation. Sorry, what was your question, dear? Harvin, sorry, I said, uh, according to LPQB, if you have a diploma that is recognized and accredited, you don't have to do a foundation program. So I said, check LPQB's website, which the site uh, link is given to you, and then take this knowledge and ask your college. And your college will tell you if you need or they encourage you to do the foundation. If they only encourage you to do it, but you don't need it, you can pursue your degree immediately. Okay. All right, last, uh, last few questions. Benji has to go for class. I told my kids, my students to come back at 1.15. It's 1.20. I'm so sorry. Huh? Okay, let me just take the last few questions. Which law is more in demand in Malaysia, human rights or criminal law? Huh. There is a lot of other types of law, darling, uh, besides human rights and criminal law. Um, to be very frank, human rights is not very much in demand in Malaysia right now, but there are some very forward-thinking lawyers like Edmund Bond, okay? Some very forward-thinking lawyers like Edmund Bond, which have always been one step ahead when it comes to human rights. Uh, when he started about 10 plus years ago, he started the uh, uh, My Constitution movement and stuff like that. 
And only after that, the human rights thing caught traction. But an important thing that Mr. Bond is working on now is business human rights. So ensuring businesses comply with human rights, such as minimum wage, uh, safe working conditions, all of these things. So if you want to explore human rights, another angle that perhaps could become big in the future is business human rights, okay? But human rights itself, such as constitutional issues uh, and administrative issues, such as what uh, our late Karpal Singh used to do and uh, Govindyo, Malik Intias, these people do, right? Is few and far apart, okay? The cases on it is few and far apart. It is usually not their only thing that they do. They also do a, a myriad of other types of cases and they happen to also do constitutional and human rights issues. Criminal law, as long as there are criminals, criminal law will be in demand. There are a lot of other civil options. What about breaches of contracts? What about tortious wrongs? What about civil tortious wrongs, which are civil wrongs? There are many areas of the law. Okay? Penji, what should be my minimum pointer to qualify for law in public universities? I'm not sure, darling. I'm really not sure because I have had friends that go in with 3.4 to uh, UM, and then there is uh, friends of mine with 3.8 going, okay? Different universities, let's be very frank, different uh, different races, all of this, uh, the, the, the pointer is one consideration. Now, all public universities nowadays have an interview as well, so if you impress during the interview, uh, they can let you in, but if you have a very good pointer, but you don't impress during the interview, also, you won't get in. Okay, so what I would say is push for the best. All right, I got in, my pointer was 3.8 or something like that. Three A's and one B plus in STPM. Uh, it was a millennia ago. I don't remember what my pointer was. But yeah, I got in with that. But I had friends with lower grades as well that got in. Okay, yeah, you're talking about STPM, right? That was my pointer in STPM. Okay, uh, next one. Thank you for the detailed explanation. Thank you so much, darling. Uh, recorded session is on. Thanks, Penji. Penji, I'm an STPM lever. What kind of questions should I prepare for in the interview in public view? Oh, very good question. Okay, I have never been for an interview. My time was fully no interview. It was just quota system and the online system and that. Now, um, but my students who have gone for the interviews before have told me that they don't always ask you questions on the law because they don't expect you to know the law. You haven't started your legal journey yet, but they ask you questions to test your thinking skills, to test your morality. Okay, they ask you like, if you see trash here, what do you do? If you see a friend do this, what do you do? They also want to check your language proficiency because like uh, our dear guest before us, uh, Miss Latifa had said, that if you're unable to articulate yourself, you're not going to make a good lawyer. Okay, you're not going to make a good lawyer. So they also check for a proficiency in the language. Now, I would like to say, uh, most Sikh students who apply have a good chance because, number one, very few of us apply. Number two, they kind of like us when it comes to the law. Okay, because a lot of y'all are proficient in the language, a lot of y'all do think well, and uh, well, a lot of Sikhs before y'all have set a very good example when it comes to being figures in the law. Okay, so that's that. I will leave y'all with all of this. I'll leave y'all with all of this. Um, I have to run. I'm so sorry. Sikh Nojuan Sabah Malaysia, thank you so much. Uh, Marjot Virji will round this class up. I will email this slide after class. I finish at three something. I'll email it out after class. And we will pick it. A um, few things I just wanted to share. Last thing with y'all is this. UPU closes its application in a matter of days. Okay. And secondly, if you're looking at uh, um, public, uh, sorry, looking at uh, foundation programs, A-level programs, or even degree programs, we have, we have a BAC is having an open day right now. You can check on Instagram. BAC's official account is insta back underscore BAC, something like that. Okay. Uh, just search for Breakfast as you call. You'll find the official one. The link to the online open day is there. And it's going on right now and tomorrow. In case you're tired, it's now and tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much. As much as I've said BAC is this and that, Please remember, I'm also a big proponent of doing STPM, getting into matriculation and getting into public university because that is the cheapest option available. Okay. All right. 
Thank you so much. I hope you learned something. Benji's going to log off. Is that okay? Can? Okay, Benji Lifa. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to log off. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Uh, I, I was made to understand that uh, the CLP examinations are going to take place on the 29th. And uh, you actually took time out to uh, before your class. And I believe you have a class now. Uh, Sikh Nojan Sabha is extremely grateful. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that uh, we have uh, heard three distinguished speakers. Uh, both, uh, all three of them are in the area of law. Uh, you have heard from Dr. Rabinder uh, the challenges that you face. You have heard from uh, Latifa Koya, Ms. Latifa Koya, the former MACC chief. Uh, what is it like from a day-to-day -day basis uh, if you're interested in championing certain issues of human rights? You should. By all means, you should. There's nothing to stop you. You should go out there, champion. If you need help, reach out to them. Dr. Rabinder, Ms. Latifa, even, even in fact, Ms. Amrita, they're all very approachable people. You should take the opportunity. Don't stay in your cocoon. Go out, meet them, talk to them, ask them how they can be involved. Uh, to, to end this session, uh, Sikh Nojan Sabah Malaysia would like to thank our esteemed speakers, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Rabinder, Ms. Latifa Koya, Ms. Amrita, for being here with us today, sharing their thoughts on law as a career for our youths. Uh, Sikh Nojan Sabah would also like to take this opportunity to thank you guys, our viewers, uh, who have tuned in with us today. Uh, for this in insightful session. With all your support, uh, we very really believe that uh, Sikh Nojan Sabah will be organizing even more youth career sessions, uh, uh, which is catered specifically for youths, uh, school leavers, law students, fresh graduates. And uh, do stay tuned. Uh, you can follow the Facebook page. I believe they have all the social media. Uh, follow. And uh, also, please do not forget to reach out to Sikh Nojan Sabam Nation if you need any further questions. I believe uh, uh, Ajipal Singh's number as well as Guru Simran's number is on the poster, today's poster. Uh, get in touch, uh, speak. And as far as uh, law is concerned, uh, before I end, I would like to say that you have to love what you do. You have to have passion for it. And uh, nothing will stop you from achieving greatness. Nothing, nothing will stop you from achieving success. Uh, remember the three secrets to success are hard work, hard work, and hard work. With that, thank you very much. Wai Guruji Ka Khalsa, Wai Guruji Ki Fateh.